My name is Marina Kim. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Ashoki U, and we are delighted to formally welcome you to the Ashoki U Exchange 2013. So thank you for all of you who've flown in from all over the world, some of you from more local, uh, but many of you from across the country, even as far as Asia, Latin America, Africa. It really is an, a, an incredible group of people. So I actually wanted to start by talking about you. Uh, just as Ashoka looks for amazing social entrepreneurs that we can elect and select as Ashoka Fellows, Ashoka U is always on the hunt for educational innovators. Whether you're a student, a faculty member, a senior university leader, a social entrepreneur, community member, business leader, we're looking for people who care about both building the potential in others, but also the potential in themselves as leaders, as creators, and innovators. So what we hope to create is an environment at the Ashoki U Exchange where all of this potential, you, and all of the potential for impact that you could create um, can turn into spontaneous combustion. So what we're hoping for is that you can look around yourselves and see where you can find, you know, take your little sparks of energy and ideas and look for where you might find collisions and explosions of new ideas, new collaborations, new jobs, new partners. Um, so, you know, we really did scour around the globe and around the country to try to bring together an incredibly diverse and committed and interesting and, um, you know, complementary group from all the different stakeholders that can come together and together do really big things. Um, in terms of the, um, the spontaneous combustion, um, we actually hope and we, we expect that as rule breakers, uh, some of you may or may not go to sessions. Um, we have created a lot of very carefully curated content. Um, and for some people, you may want to go and try to go to as many sessions as you, you can. For others, you may want to go to no sessions and actually just spend your time networking in the lobby, in hallways, or in the networking lounge tent that we'll have at the University of San Diego. So we love you either way, and we hope that you take, take this opportunity to meet each other, share ideas, and again, find these sparks of new co potential collaborations um, and really use the exchange as an opportunity. So we invite you, just as we're hoping to see more students take ownership and drive their own educational agenda, we encourage all of you to take ownership of driving your own exchange agenda. So if you're looking to find certain collaborators, go out and find them. If you're looking to find a job, you know, there's a lot of employers here in the social sector, in the corporate sector, you know, really find those connections. So we, we see that there's so much uh, potential and opportunity that can happen if you're, if you're open to it and if you're proactive. But beyond individually thinking about what you would like to get out of it or contribute to the, to the broader group or people you would like to connect with, ultimately, we hope you feel that you're part of something that's growing, something that's global, a global community of innovators and entrepreneurs who really care about the potential of higher education and education more broadly, and really believe in the values of social impact and social innovation. Um, and we, we hope that beyond feeling part of something big and growing and exciting, we hope that you actually take this responsibility of being part of a community somewhat seriously. So some of you were there at the reception and the welcome yesterday. And my colleague Bita mentioned that if you look at your badges, those of you who have a badge in TAN have been to the exchange one or more times. And some of them are veterans of over four years, so try to find those people. But for those of you who have badges in blue, we really encourage you, uh, well, not you, we, we encourage the TAN badges to go and find people with blue badges and make sure they feel welcome and ask them about themselves and connect and really, really help build this community. We were really excited to, when we ran some of the numbers um, that this year we've nearly doubled from the past year of exchange participants. And not only that, we've nearly doubled the number of countries represented. So 
We have 650 people or so here. We have nearly, we have 30 countries, uh, about 122 universities, 50 plus social entrepreneurs um, who, who work as full-time social entrepreneurs. And uh, we, we also have two thirds of the group are new for the first time, and one third have been before. So again, there is a huge opportunity to really be part of something new and growing and exciting, but we, we hope that as we grow, growth isn't the metric. We really want you to feel that you're part of something intimate and special where the community and the people is really the core. And at the risk of being a little bit cheesy, um, we hope that you stay open to what possibilities and what uh, opportunities might happen here. Um, you know, from thinking about past exchanges, people have found their business partners and collaborators. Some people have found dates. Uh, other, people, <laughs> other people have gotten jobs. Um, so, you know, if you approach this with an openness and, 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 you know, really create some of your own luck and choose your own adventure and really go out and try to meet a lot of people, you know, we have so much belief in the quality and the diversity of the people here that pretty much anyone you meet, you'll find fascinating. So we hope that there's a little bit of sparks of magic created, uh, but ultimately, it's not what happens here, it's what happens when you go back. So we hope that we've immersed you in a little cocoon of happiness and ideas and possibility and creativity, and you know, you'll get that over the next few days, but we hope when you go back, you can try to keep some of that spark, some of that energy, and really infuse it back into your own institution, community, and campus. But ultimately, um, we are a broad team, not only just a community of people, and it really takes a village. So we wanted to extend a special thank you to all of our incredible partners and sponsors who've made all of this possible. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it's really been a, a full-time, year-round effort of multiple people and multiple partners. So just I wanted to extend a special thanks to the Dell Social Innovation Challenge, Verizon, Photo Wings, the Cordis Foundation, um, Turnstone, and Left Brain Right Brain Productions. With an extra special thank you to our campus host, the University of San Diego. And yes. <laughs> And you'll, you'll really see that in terms of magic, when you go to the campus tomorrow, you're really taken back in time and it is truly magical. So we hope you soak up some of that ambiance. Um, but uh, in terms of magic in USD, it is my honor to introduce Provost Julie Sullivan, who's been uh, one of the, the great people I've had the pleasure to work with over the last few years uh, in our work with USD being a change maker campus. And uh, she'll be able to share a little bit about what USD is doing as a changemaker campus, some of her vision, and uh, why they're happy to be co-hosting the Ashoki U Exchange this year. So Julie Sullivan, thank you. Well, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, Marina emailed me at midnight last night. You don't have any slides, do you? No, I don't have any slides. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, I was sitting on my computer and could email her right away, back. So, uh, but really, this is a, a great honor and pleasure for the University of San Diego to co-host with Ashoka this year's exchange. And I want to take just a few minutes to share with you my passion and the university's passion for change-making and change-making education, why we think it's so important that we're participating in this, and what we hope you will find during your next a day or two days with us. Really, if, if you look back and you think about the purpose of universities, for a thousand years, universities have been the launch pads to lead people to new paths of self-fulfilling lives, of finding their place in the world, and of charting their course. It has been the university that has often put that person and started that person on that journey. The universities are launch pads where current generations and future generations, of course, gain new knowledge and skills. We hope they discover more about themselves. And we often find this is where they choose those paths and often chart that course 
that will be their future journey in life. So I am so grateful that Bill Drayton expanded his mission a few years ago to not only identifying and supporting individual change makers, but identifying, connecting, and leveraging change maker universities. He identified the university as the ecosystem that can really have the largest impact on creating that next generation of change makers that will be spread across our planet. And I don't think there's any better institution he could have chosen than a university. Since the origin of the since the origin of the universities at the beginning of the 12th century, we have always found our relevance in the context of our society. What we have been about is trying to better understand the society in which we live in, try to better learn how we can connect to it. That's what we've been about for 1,000 years. So what does that mean today? How can we as a university be relevant to this society that we live in today? Well, I don't have to tell this audience that the current challenges facing our neighborhoods, our communities, our planet are innumerable. Yet, by your very presence here, I know that you know in your hearts, in your minds, that there's never been a greater opportunity to meet these challenges with sustainable approaches. Why has there never been a better opportunity? Because our society has never been more connected. We have never had more free and ubiquitous access to knowledge and information. But maybe even more importantly, we've never had more access to each other and the collective impact that we can have together. So my belief is that the relevant university of this time, today, is to embrace our responsibility and ignite our passion to lead the change that improves the condition of the human family and of our earth. And this is certainly something that is central to the mission and values of the University of San Diego. At the University of San Diego, which some of you uh, who haven't been on our campus, as Marina said, we really look forward to welcome you tomorrow. But at the University of San Diego, we seek to provide an education that inspires and empowers our students to be change makers, to make that difference that they seek in the world, to become individuals that have self-fulfilling lives, but are also proactively creating positive social, economic, and environmental change in this world. Value, positive change and value. So how do we do this? If this is the kind of education we're seeking to provide, how, do I, how would I describe that kind of education? Well, in addition to providing our students that breadth and that depth of knowledge that we all know is fundamental to a university, that helps any person understand the interconnectedness of this world and their place in it. We're all trying to provide that breadth and that depth so that human being can understand the complexity of our world, analyze problems, and create solutions. But we're also trying to provide values, attitudes. Values and attitudes of a change maker. And what might be some of these fundamental values and attitudes? One, of course, is empathy. You've heard Bill Drayton speak about em empathy frequently. His aspiration is for the community where every one of us puts ourselves in the shoes of others before we act. I personally have seen the tremendous value of empathy and really the creative combustion that, that arises when empathy and imagination come together to solve a problem, to help a person, to create a better community. What other values and attitudes are we stressing? Teamwork. Because positive change can only be created through collaboration. Our world is so complex. It will only be created through collaboration and through the collision of different perspectives and ideas. The problems today require that. 
and they require teamwork to get that collision of different perspectives and different ideas. Leadership. We stress leadership. Change makers have to be leaders. They have to take initiative, and they cannot be paralyzed by the fear of failure. That's the worst paralysis in the world. Change making requires optimism and confidence to embrace challenges and to see them as opportunities for positive transformation. So what are some of the big ideas and change making programs that my colleagues at the University of San Diego have been working so hard on in the last two years and continue to work on? I'll mention just a few. First, in terms of experiential learning. We are trying to create a portfolio of challenges. A portfolio of challenges that can allow our students to have an experiential learning opportunity to actually come up with their own idea and to make it, bring it to reality and to fruition. To either meeting the one challenge that our university as a whole has decided to embrace, which is something we call the USD One Challenge. To this year, our USD One Challenge is focused on the environment and wasteful consumption and production. Or we have a social innovation challenge where you can pick your own challenge, whatever sparks your passion, and create your idea and your venture to address that challenge. So we need to give you that experience of being a change maker. We need to give you that curriculum in the classroom as well. My colleagues are developing a change maker minor. It'll be an interdisciplinary minor. And in universities, we don't know how to have minors that don't have a home in a particular unit. But we are struggling. And our faculty in the College of Arts and Sciences, in the School of Leadership, in the School of Business, in the School of Peace Studies, they'll make it happen. They'll truly make it happen. It'll be an interdisciplinary change maker minor. We have created a change maker scholarship program. We want to honor and identify, identify, honor, and inspire those students who really exhibit the change maker spirit on the USD campus and make them role models for the rest of our community and the rest of our student body. Those are just a few of the ideas that my colleagues who have so many wonderful ideas are working on now. But why are we so excited about hosting the exchange? Why are we so excited about being here? Because we've lived it. Two years ago, I went with six other people from the University of San Diego. Patricia Marquez, Ron Kaufman, Chris Nive, Nadia Auk, and a student, Zach Flotty, who's now an alumni. We found that energy, that life-giving energy that the exchange offers. We were energized. We went back, seven people, and we told all of our colleagues about it. The next year, last year, at Arizona State, we had over 20 people from the USD community participating in the exchange. They came back. They were energized. They told their colleagues. And this year, with our volunteers helping with the exchange, we have over 100 people whose lives will be touched this weekend by this exchange. And yes, it takes a leader, but even more importantly, as Marina says, it takes a village. I'll say it takes an entire university. You cannot be a change maker campus unless this passion and these values are inspired throughout your campus, in your faculty, in your students, in your senior administrators who are working in academic affairs and student affairs. And I am so proud of the University of San Diego and so proud of my colleagues because all of those people exist on my campus. And I want to give them a shout out and tell them how proud I am of them. <clears throat> but this day, tomorrow, and however it carries on for you over the, over the weekend, and I wrote this before seeing Marina's slides, but the exchange really is an explosion. It's an explosion of energy and creativity around change maker education. You cannot not be touched by your time here. You'll leave with life-giving energy. And you'll stay in contact with one another and you'll keep learning from one another because that's what we're about as a change making community. 
So I'm delighted you're all here. I'm so delighted you came from so many places. We had auspicious goals for the number of people and where you would come from to be with us this weekend. And we were delighted to welcome you. And now I have one last honor and pleasure. And it really is an honor for me. I had the honor of introducing the next speaker. And the next speaker is Morgan Schwenke. <laughs> he is a University of San Diego senior, hailing from Northern California, majoring in art history. He's the president of our undergraduate student organization, Associated Students. And I have to tell you, he is the most outstanding student leader I have encountered in my 30 years of my academic career. So let me introduce you to an authentic change maker, Morgan Schwanke. Thank you. Thank you. Is this on? All right. All right, you know, I must tell you, I'm very humbled to be presenting here today. When uh, my professor first asked me to present at the Ashoki U Exchange, I must admit, I was pretty shocked. I asked her, uh, Professor Marquez, why me? You know, there are so many students at the University of San Diego that are doing all these amazing things with their lives. I mean, really creating change. So why me? She said, Morgan, first of all, you're a handsome young man. You'll be able to charm them with your good looks. Said, Professor Marquez, you're absolutely right. I think I have the sex appeal to keep their attention. <laughs> Second, she said, Morgan, you're relatable. You know, everyone speaking before you and after you are the Michael Jordans of change making, the big shots. And you're definitely a change maker, Morgan, but you're no Michael Jordan. You'll be relatable because you're nothing special. <laughs> said, geez, hold on a second. That's not what my mom tells me every morning. <laughs> Finally, she said, Morgan, as student body president, you've had this amazing opportunity to observe change makers pop up all over campus. Now it's time to water the seeds and watch them blossom. Pause for a second, and I said, you know, Professor Marquez, that's a crazy radical metaphor. I'm not really sure what you mean by it, but I'm definitely digging it, so sign me up. So here I am speaking to all of you today, and I want to first say welcome to San Diego, especially to those of you who have flown across the country and around the world to be here today. As we say in Southern California, we're super stoked to have you. <laughs> that being said, I want you to take a second to look around the room. You all are surrounded by 600 absolutely amazing individuals of all different ages, backgrounds, and educations. Some of us are younger in the room, and some of us are older. Some of us are quite accomplished change makers, and some of us are just beginning our journeys. But we each have our own stories, and we each are in different stages of writing our stories. My goal for you this weekend is to recognize that this is not a conference. This is an exchange, an exchange of ideas and an exchange of stories. Today, I want to talk to you about human interconnectedness and how human interconnectedness is helping us write our change-making stories at our universities and in our organizations. So I want to ask you all a question. Have you ever gotten a parking ticket or a speeding ticket, and you go to pay it and you think to yourself, well, crap, that could have paid for my groceries for a week, or that could have taken a huge chunk out of my rent bill, or that could have paid for my gas for a week? Yeah, I know, the people in the room who have Priuses are like, what is he talking about? <laughs> you know, recently I was reflecting on the cost of attending college, and I started thinking to myself, how much ice cream could I buy with all that tuition money? So I pulled out my calculator and I put some numbers down and came to realize that the average price of going to a four-year university could fill five Olympic-sized lap pools to the brim with ice cream. Yes, these are the types of things that college students think about when they have free time in between classes and late night munchies. But, but it's no joke. College is really, really expensive, leading a lot of people to ask the question, is it really worth the bang for your buck? There's no doubt that the cost of attending college has and will continue to go up. American students alone have now accumulated over $1 trillion in student debt. $1 trillion. I know, that's like an ocean of ice cream. <laughs> 
And then there's the University of California system, which recently just created its first online classes that students can take. For 120 bucks, you can knock out one of those core requirements without even leaving the comfort of your 10 by 8 dorm room. <laughs> it's a huge step for the UC system, leading many people to ask the question, might this be the beginning to the end of college? And then there are people out there like Peter Thiel, co-founder of PayPal and the first investor in Facebook, who actually pays young adults to not go to college. Last year, Thiel gave 24 entrepreneurs $100,000 each to abandon the college concept and pursue their entrepreneurial dreams. What would you do with $100,000? Start a nonprofit company with some of your friends? Open a successful chain of ice cream stores? We're actually going to hear from a Teal fellow later on tonight in the TEDx event. So let me ask you, how valuable are our universities anyways? To answer that question, I want to touch on what I believe are the most valuable elements of a college experience. And talk to you a little bit about how those elements are driving change making on campuses around the world, empowering both students and faculty. Change making thrives uh, at the university level because colleges create this unconstrained environment where students can explore their passions, dream big, and create their own reality. You know, I remember walking around campus my first few weeks of school as a freshman, overhearing students say things like, I'm going to be an accounting major, or I'm going to be a plastic surgeon, or I'm going to be a professional surfer, or uh, my personal favorite, I'm going to be a male model. <laughs> no, that isn't me, I promise. <laughs> but everyone just seemed so set on their path. And I became convinced that everyone at the school really had their lives together except me. Some of you uh, may have had this similar experience, but as you look back now, you realize that None of those people really had any clue what they were doing, and neither did you. And you know what? That's absolutely OK. You know, it took me two years to decide my major, and I definitely faced some pressures along the way. I don't know if any of you have seen these before, but every few months, Yahoo comes out with these two articles that tell you the most uh, profitable majors to study and also the most worthless majors to study. So you can be sure that my mom was pretty stoked when I called her up one day and I said, hey mom, guess what? I'm going to study my two passions, liberal arts and art history. According to Yahoo, the two most worthless majors to graduate with. <laughs> but you know what? I bounced back. Because these are the types of pressures that change makers face in the real world every day. Social norms, personal expectations, political, economic, and physical borders. These are the types of pressures that can and very often do keep us as changemaker students and professionals from choosing a path, writing a story, and chasing down a dream. So when it finally did come time for me to choose my major, I definitely took the opportunity and time to explore my options. At first, I wanted to become a marine biologist because I'm a surfer and I was scared yet weirdly interested in shark attacks. Probably from watching too much Shark Week on the Discovery Channel, to be honest. And then I became interested in real estate, because finding value in property seemed a lot like finding value in other things, like my nerdy Pokemon and baseball card collection that I sold on eBay in high school. Finally, I was able to find my passions through art history classes I took while studying abroad and joining clubs and organizations like student government. Every day, I look forward to my classes and my campus involvement because I get to study things that I really love and work with students whom I truly care about. And that's the beauty of college. You have this amazing opportunity to explore your passions and your fellow professors and classmates are there to support you along the way. And this curiosity, this very zen way of learning, it doesn't die off in college. It sticks with you throughout the rest of your life. If you're living in that element where you're chasing what you love, you will begin manifesting your own reality. And success will find you. And, and I'm not talking about financial success. I mean, money is great, but your story is most powerful when it positively affects other people. And that's what, it, what it's all about. How your story positively affects the people around you. As student body president, I really have had this amazing opportunity to observe changemakers create a very real and positive impact on individuals in our local community, in our campus community, and in communities around the world. 
Several weeks ago, I got coffee with a close friend of mine and fellow student government member named Huda. Huda is an immigrant from Somalia who lives with her mother and four siblings. Every day, she drives her siblings to school and cooks their meals every day and somehow still finds time to go to classes as a full-time student and work full-time as well. She has an enormous amount of responsibility as a sophomore in college, but she also has an enormous heart. Huda has the amazing gift of human connection. She deeply cares about other individuals and nurtures close relationships with students all over campus. She's the epitome of a USD changemaker that is just beginning to explore her social entrepreneurship story and is one day hoping to change the way in which religion affects businesses in Somalia. And then there's our Toreros quarterback, Kyle Miller, who started an anti-bullying program called Lace Up Stand Up. Neon green shoelaces may seem out of fashion, but Lace Up Stand Up has used them to unite youth against bullying through promoting safe learning environments at middle schools. You'll probably see a lot of our Ashoka U volunteers wearing these green shoelaces throughout the weekend. And then there's Moirini, who over 20 years ago was forced to flee his village during the Second Sudanese Civil War and walk over 500 miles to Kenya. Now he and several other USD graduates are heading back to Sudan to install solar power systems and bring electricity to villages for the first time. The University of San Diego is a special university because we embrace the service and stewardship of a faith-based institution, but we also ask big questions, challenging our Catholic tradition and thinking outside of ourselves. You know, I think one of my personal mentors on campus, Father Mike, says it best when he says that life is about finding where your passions meet the world's greatest needs. Whether you're a student, a faculty, or a professional, you're here because you're passionate about change making. You're here because you recognize that life is a gift and service is the rent we pay for living. So I'd like to close things up with one last story that I think really ties things together here nicely. Last year, four students from Queen's University in Canada gathered around a table one day and decided to create a Facebook page called Queen's U Compliments. The page prompted fellow students to submit compliments about the camp campus community, and the four founding members would anonymously post the compliments and tag the individuals being complimented. Within a matter of days, the page blew up, and it quickly spread to universities around the world. I'd be willing to bet that most of the institutions represented here actually has one of these Facebook compliments pages. And so in December of last year, Facebook compliments arrived at USD in fashion. Perfect timing, one week before finals, it was destined for success. Every student knows that for every hour of studying you do, you have to spend like an hour on Facebook. It's like a rule or something. <laughs> so within a matter of hours, the compliments started rolling in. And at one point in the night, it seemed as if everyone had just taken a break from studying and were fully engulfed in liking, sharing, and commenting on all the compliments that were funneling through the page. Our news feeds became waterfalls of love notes, shout outs, and funny stories. You'd see a friend get a compliment, and it would make you smile. You'd give a compliment, and it would make you feel good inside. You'd get a compliment, and it would make your day. These are random acts of kindness, the smallest tidbits of change making that happen all over the world. What we often forget in our daily lives is that the smallest things can really make the biggest difference. Our universities and our organizations are built on these tightly knit webs of relationships and connections. Our lives impact the lives of those around us, and sometimes in ways that we don't even realize. And so I'd like to leave you with two responsibilities today. Number one, under your chair, I've put a note card with a prompt on it. Write your authentic story down on this note card and give it to someone at the exchange that you don't know. Tell them who you are, why you're here, and where you're going. I hope this will allow you to connect with them this weekend and hopefully beyond. And number two, keep writing your story. Whether you're a student, a faculty, or a professional, whether you're a Michael Jordan of change making or just a Facebook complimenter, keep writing your story, keep dreaming big, and keep creating your own reality. The world deserves your dedication to a lifestyle that you truly love because that's what will bring out the best version in you. And so, in the enlightening words of the Dos Equis guy, <laughs> become the most interesting man or woman you can be, but do it responsibly, do it with pride and dignity, and do it to manifest the future of your dreams. Thank you for your time.
Wow. I wish I was that funny and smart and good looking. <laughs> okay, so I am delighted to introduce our next speaker. Uh, not only does he really embody more than anyone I can think of um, the theme of Unlock the U in university through his own personal story and what he's doing to support education for many, many other leaders, um, but he is a true hero. So originally, we had uh, slotted as one of our keynotes uh, Bernard Amade, who's an Ashoka Fellow, a wonderful speaker, founder of Engineers Without Borders. Unfortunately, he's been battling some sort of bronchitis for many weeks, and his doctor told him he couldn't fly. He told us this yesterday. And heroically, um, Patrick Awa, who's the founder and president of Ashesi University, um, and is a true social entrepreneur. He stepped up to the challenge, and honestly, I think it's, it's the way it was meant to end up. So you're really the perfect next person to speak. Um, in the design of this session, in the theme of Unlock the U in University, we really wanted to get a student perspective, an academic perspective, and an alumni retiree perspective, so that it's, it's really a whole life cycle of change making and unlocking. So Patrick, can we welcome you to the stage? And thank you so much for taking up the challenge of doing a keynote with 24 hours notice. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you very much for the invitation. Um, <laughs> I would like to um, talk about the you um, uh, in university, finding you in university. Um, and to start with the story of how I got to go to university, um, I grew up in Ghana, I applied to Swarthmore College to study engineering, and got admitted uh, with a very good scholarship. It was $15,000 at the time and my family was responsible for paying $100 a year, which we could afford. And so I went to the American Embassy and applied for a visa, and my first visa application was denied. Um, the problem was that in order to get my visa, I had to, my parents had to demonstrate that they could meet the family obligation for four years. So we needed to show a bank statement that showed $400 in the bank. And my family didn't have it. So, you know, we, you know we wrote, I wrote to Swarthmore and I said, I can't come because this $100 really means $400 for us. And we don't have $400. Uh, and so Swarthmore waived my family obligation and my second visa application was a lot more successful. Thank, thank goodness. So that's how I got to even come to the United States, was the kindness of others. And it was really about this invisible hand, uh, people that I did not know, who didn't know me, who had set up a scholarship fund at, at Swarthmore, uh, people who were managing an endowment, and people who were making the decisions to reach out to some kid in Africa and get him here for an education. Uh, so this is how I got to, to, to get to university. And then I experienced this amazing education uh, that required me to do more than just memorize information, which is what education is in Ghana. And uh, you know this liberal arts approach to education, which is about critical analy analytical thought about very broad perspectives um, and deep perspectives. And I got to experience a, a campus culture where students could be trusted to do exams at home, to have take home exams and people wouldn't cheat. And this was a revelation to me. Uh, so great four year uh, college experience and then on to Microsoft and did very well there. And that's what university is supposed to be about, right? Prepare people to have rewarding careers. Um, I was making good money and it was all good. 
Then an interesting thing happened. I became a parent, and suddenly my world was upside down because I was looking at this child and wondering about the next generation of Africans, his generation. What world were we leaving for the next generation? A world where in Africa, the news out of Africa was wars in, in Rwanda and Somalia and Liberia and Sierra Leone and DRC um, and on and on, and, and stagnation. And I felt, wow, this is a problem for the next generation. And the people like me who had had this incredible opportunity, who had been reached out to by this invisible hand and given such great opportunities, ought to be part of the solution. Uh, and so I went back to Ghana and started to have lots of conversation with friends. We'd take a problem and say, why is this the way it is? And we'd get a set of answers. And we'd take each of those answers and ask why. And very quickly, what we realized was a fundamental problem was leadership. People in positions of influence and power who were accepting the status quo um, or who were corrupt and so on. Um, and I went to where these leaders were being educated, the universities, and discovered two things. One was leader, uh, education still is just rote memorization, and very narrow. Um, kids spilling out of classrooms into verandas because the classrooms were so full. Labs that didn't function. And the students in, tho in those universities represented just 5% of their age group who got the opportunity to go to college. And this is true across Sub-Saharan Africa. The problem with 5% is that it's too small, but more importantly, it means all of those students in, in these universities, they're going to be running the continent one day, that 5%. They're going to be the leaders. And so the way they're educated is critically important. And I decided that's what I was going to get engaged with. I was going to set up a university with a mission of educating a new generation of ethical entrepreneurial leaders. But the university is not just a beautiful place. I mean, the place is important. It nurtures the soul to be in an environment uh, that is welcoming and that's comfortable. But really, it's about the people. How do we reach out to others and give them the same opportunities that we have had? And how do we prepare them to not only lead rewarding lives for themselves, but to be change makers in their society. And, and for us, that meant we were going to introduce a liberal arts approach to education to Ghana and to Africa. And so we have a curriculum that has you know, breadth, students studying the humanities and the social sciences and math, but also that has technical majors such as computer science and business management because we had to adapt the liberal arts to our circumstance. That the businesses in Ghana needed people with very specific technical skills right out of college. Um, and so small classes, technology, and hands-on, and what I found actually is that you know, what I used to describe as a hybrid is actually not a hybrid. I used to say this is a hybrid of the liberal arts and pre-professional majors. Actually, it is truly the liberal arts. It is truly a marrying of different perspectives, of the perspectives of people who do things with their hands, of the perspective of people who are problem solvers, who model businesses and who model economies in addition to, to asking and answering the, the deep questions, the really profound questions, such as, what is a good society? Who am I? What is my role in that society? What is beauty? What is the truth? These profound questions that the liberal arts is so well noted for doing, but also with the perspectives of people who just tinker uh, with things, who create things. And then also a liberal arts education that is about, and this is something else that the liberal arts is so good about, it's about deep ethical thought, right? And for us to engage ethics, 
not as preaching to students, but as a truly intellectual conversation between equals about, about the good society, about what kind of society we want, um, and about empathy. And as we've done this, we have actually, over the last uh, 11 years or so, changed people's lives. Festus grew up in a rural village in northern Ghana um, as a farmer. He came to Accra, the capital, lived in a slum, put himself through high school selling gum on the streets of Accra. Um, and he came to work as a gardener at Ashesi, and eventually we noticed him and enrolled him. Uh, he's graduated, and like many of our graduates, like all of our graduates, is out there um, in, a, in a profession. You know, there's students who've started businesses, who are working in already established businesses, um, and who are making deep change. But more than that, we have been successful in creating a college environment where students have taken ownership for the posture of ethics, of understanding that it is their responsibility not only to be ethical as individuals, but to hold each other accountable. And a student body that can say to the faculty and the administration, you don't need to proctor our exams because we will. So we don't proctor exams anymore at Ashesi. The students do. Um, and they don't cheat. They sign a statement that says they've not cheated, and they've not seen anybody else do so, or they check a box that says, I've seen violations, and here are what the violations are, and hold those accountable who have violated the rules. And through a community service requirement, I think one of the most important things that we've done is to get students engaged with their community, to reach out to others, to reach out to the next generation. And so having this, this idea that we all need to be part of this invisible hand that reaches out to people, that touches lives, that encourages people to become part of it as well, that we all need to be tinkerers, that we all need to be doers, that we, we learn by doing, um, and that we all need to really hold ourselves to the highest standards of accountability um, and to set very high goals for us, for ourselves, such as changing the world. I would like to end uh, with a very simple statement that I think that unlocking the you in university really is not about looking at you as an individual, but as looking, looking at us together as a global community, um, as a community. What, who are we? What is our role in the world? What, what are the accomplishments we're gonna make in the world? How are we? going to create a world where a billion people in Africa will have a completely different world within one generation. This, if we can do, then we would have unlocked the you, the us in university. Thank you. Wow, so I wish I was as funny as Morgan and as credible at doing 24-hour notice keynotes as Patrick. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we're going to end with another treat. Um, so we are very lucky at Ashoka to have a plethora of incredibly inspiring Ashoka fellows that we work with. Um, but Mark Friedman um, has the ability to touch us and, and think. So when Eric Dawson asked you yesterday if you know any young people in your life, with Mark Friedman, it's do you know any older people in your life? Um, so we're really trying to cover the whole life cycle. 
Um, and so I'm very honored to introduce Mark Friedman, who's the founder of Encore.org, which is really looking at creating a mind shift for what is possible for people over age 50 and, and really build huge value and potential in, in terms of leadership in, at any age, in every age. So thank you, Mark. Oh, no. I, I wasn't going to put the U in university. I was just going to talk to you about big demographic changes and what we should do about it. But I was so inspired by Patrick's talk personally that I thought I'd improvise for a minute. Uh, like Patrick, I also went to Swarthmore College. <laughs> there are about 12 of us out in the world, so the, uh, the idea that we'd be <laughs> speaking back to back is uh, unlikely, to say the least. And also, unlike Patrick, who had this grand vision that led him across an entire ocean into a, a, a different world, I, I managed my way from, from Philadelphia to Swarthmore. And the only reason I got there is because the day Swarthmore was coming to my high school to recruit, I had a French test. And it was at the exact same time. And I, I seem to have some kind of still yet unlabeled uh, 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 disability in which I could only remember words in French that began with the letter P. So if it was a, a text that had the word umbrella, beach, um, and, uh, um, uh, and some other uh, pamplemousse for the grapefruit, I was fine. But otherwise, I was destined to fail that test. So I went to the Swarthmore recruiting meeting. And next thing I knew, I had a Swarthmore degree. <laughs> A uh, hundred years ago, a psychologist by the name of G. Stanley Hall uh, wrote a book with the name Adolescence. And it was at a time, he was 60 years old, he was recovering from his own midlife crisis. And it was at a time the country itself was facing a crisis. There was a proliferation of young people who were neither children nor adults. These neither nors were a source of great anxiety in the country because many adults felt that they had the physical maturity of adults but the emotional maturity of children and at a time of a lot of upheaval, urbanization, industrialization, massive immigration, we were worried that essentially they were going to run wild. And Hall came up with this idea that we should create a moratorium period for them called adolescence. And next thing, we were expanding to universal high schools and passing child labor laws. It took 40 years till we invented the word teenager. That came with Seventeen magazine in 1944. But this idea of creating stages of life as a way of solving problems has been with us for even longer. There was no childhood before the 19th century. We used to dress kids as little adults and tell them to act accordingly. But it turns out that Hall, who was this remarkable social entrepreneur himself, really the father of American psychology, created the American Journal of Psychology, the American Psychological Association. He's the person who brought Freud and Jung to America. He had Freud and Jung and William James all living in a small brick house in Worcester, Massachusetts for a week. It's like that's those stories about how the president and the vice president are never in the White House at the same time because if you know, some disaster happened, we would lose all of our leadership. If that house had burnt down, you know, the collective unconscious would have never been invented. <laughs> um, but 20 years later, Hall wrote another book uh, just before he died. And he said, I made a huge mistake. I shouldn't have invented youth. I should have invented a new stage of life between midlife and old age. And he described it in these beautiful, soaring terms. He'd been class poet at Williams College. He described it as an Indian summer. And he said, human beings didn't reach the height of their capacity until the shadows started slanting eastward. Um, not eastward. There's no slant to this talk today, but eastward. And that people reached this point where wisdom and capacity were sort of at a perfect intersection, where people realized that life did not go on forever, that their priorities needed to change, and yet they had the wherewithal to do something with that capacity. And um, it's 100 years later, almost, since we heard from Hall about these shadows slanting eastward. And I think it's time that we invent a new stage of life in this country between midlife and anything resembling retirement and old age, partly because there's so many people who are flooding into this period. 10,000 boomers a day are turning 
60, and we hear, you know, 60 is the new 40 or the new 30. At the same time, you get senior citizen discounts at 60 or earlier, so it's sort of the old 80 at the same time, it's the new 40. I think 60 is the new 60, and this flood of people who are moving into this period are something entirely new on the landscape, but there's something that Hall talked about all those many years ago. And what's so interesting is these neither nors, neither young nor old, are also seen as a problem today, this gray wave of greedy geezers who are soon gonna be taking America to the cleaners. Um, and I think through inventing, through really reframing this period of life, we can avoid some of these calamities that we're told that are heading ineg inexorably our way, but we can capture an enormous opportunity at the same time because millions of these people, millions of these individuals want to become change makers. Nine million have already moved into what we at Encore.org call Encore Careers, passion, purpose, and a paycheck. They want to do work that provides continued means because they need it. They're looking for new meaning, and they want to do work that means something beyond themselves. But they're struggling with this transition and getting from what's last to what's next. They're also struggling with what to call themselves. What do you call yourself? Are, are you uh, an oxymoron, the young, old, the working, retired? My mother-in-law, who's hit this stage herself, tells me that she's figured out the answer to that. She, she says she's on her next to last dog. She figures she gets another like <laughs> seven years out of the current pooch and then maybe 14 more. And you know, we're used to measuring life in dog years, so maybe she's on to something. Um, but so many of these people in trying to get from aspiration to action are struggling um, not just with what they want to do next, but who they're going to be. They've been so busy raising families, holding down jobs. They know they have this other chapter in front of them. Um, but how do you actually get there? It's a do-it-yourself process, a kind of solo improvisation. And I think one of the things that they need, perhaps more than anything else, is an entirely new kind of education. I'm not talking about lifelong learning and edutainment and those kinds of classes. I'm talking about school for the second half of life, what we've been calling an homage to Ashoka U and in partnership as well, Encore U, that focuses on alumni who are at this key transition point, continuing education, even university's own faculty and staff. Can we create Encore U's, which much like Ashoka U's, help prepare change makers in the second half of life to do some of their best work in what many have considered the leftover years. I think if we can do that, if we can pull it off, we can help reduce people's anxiety. Joseph Campbell, the great scholar of myths, said midlife is when you get to the top of the ladder and discover it's leaning against the wrong wall. So a lot of us are struggling with how do you get to that other wall. But as a society, we know it's just not sustainable to load up all of our education early in life work like a maniac for the next 30 years and then get some balloon payment of leisure that we can neither afford nor really genuinely look forward to. And I think by creating the stage of life and helping to prepare people for it, we can turn this purported paradox of longevity, good for the individuals who get to live longer, but bad for societies which are weighted down with these vast dependency ratios into the payoff that it truly deserves to be, and to not just do it for all of us boomers who are flooding inexorably towards this point of transition, but for younger generations, half the young people born since 2000 in the developed world are projected to see their 100th birthdays. We need to create a new map of life for them to go with these much longer lifespans. And I'll just close with a quote from one of the guests at G. Stanley Hall's cottage, along with Freud, who said, by the way, that the keys to life were love and work. It's from Jung, and he wrote, also nearly a century ago, wholly unprepared, people embark upon the second half of life. Are there perhaps colleges for 40-year-olds which prepare them for their coming life and its demands as the ordinary colleges introduce our young people to a knowledge of the world and of life? No, there are none. Thoroughly unprepared, we take the step into the afternoon of life. Worse still, we take this step with the false presupposition that our truths and ideas will serve us as hitherto. But we cannot live the afternoon of life according to what was to the program of life's morning. For what was great in the morning will be little at evening. And what in the morning was true will at evening have become a lie. Where are those colleges? 40-year-olds a little too early, maybe 50 and 60-year-olds. 
there are some pieces of it out there, but I think many of those institutions are in this room, and I know that the leaders who will create them are here among us. Thank you. Well, that's it. Now it's break time. So just a, a few quick housekeeping announcements for the next few hours. Um, there are sessions starting in about 20 minutes, so 2.30, um, going till about 3.50. Um, we'll start uh, opening doors for our next concurrent event, the TEDx Ashoka U. Um, they'll open at 4.15. Given that we need to load over 1,000 people, <laughs> we hope that you start going there a little bit early. The program will start promptly at 5 p.m. and we have an absolutely incredible lineup, so you really don't want to miss it. So if you can start going over to the Balboa Theater from the hotel lobby, you turn right and go 100 meters. Volunteers will be signposting it the whole way. Um, we look forward to seeing you very soon and hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon and evening. Thank you.